All right, so listen, um, we're going to go over the Feast of Dedication. I wanted to do a PowerPoint and do it a little more elaborate and go through the history today. And then on the Sabbath, um, kind of wrap it up, but uh, I'm not going to do that. But I am going to begin to explain, and this has been well overdue, long overdue, I should say, to go through some of this history and try to help you all piece together some of the great acts that our forefathers inspired and moved by God did. For me, in the history, this is some of the best reading. Well, I don't know, maybe David, but close. Some of the best reading in the scriptures for me. That when the Most High is moving you and he's working with you, we are unstoppable force That's right. of people. Unstoppable. So, how many of you are familiar with the book of Maccabees by show of hands? Men and women. How many people are familiar with it? Okay. How many of you have read the Maccabees? Okay. How many of you are familiar with Alexander the so-called great? Okay, this is a bit long. Okay. Let's begin in 1 Maccabees, the first chapter. Now, 1 and 2 Maccabees, it's pretty much saying the same thing, for the most part. It, it's just the 2 Maccabees kind of helps to elaborate on what's written in 1 Maccabees. So certain names that you would see in 2 Maccabees, in some cases, repeating about the same people, in some cases. And then you also have names that are used more than once, meaning you have one person with the same, like Antiochus. He was, there's three or four, three or four or five of them that's written throughout it. Now the question is who's who? It'll take time to actually go through them. But we're going to begin in 1 Maccabees, and I'm going to put this in chronological order to give you a little precursor to the Feast of Dedication that we're celebrating. All right? So let's read 1 Maccabees, the first chapter. And we're going to begin in the first verse. Now I'm asking the question, brothers and sisters, how long do you want this to go for? Three hours. Cool. Yeah, three hours. <laughs> <laughs> All righty then. So let's begin chapter one, verse one. Can I get a reading? First Maccabees chapter one, verse one. And it happened after that Alexander, the son of Philip, the Macedonian, who came out of the land of Chetem, had smitten Darius, the king of the Persians and Medes, that he reigned in his stead, the first over Greece. Okay. So uh, what it says, and it happened after Alexander, this is Alexander, the so-called great or the Greek. It says he was the son of Philip the Mac Macedonian. Uh, I wish I had some maps up, but don't worry about it. Uh, Macedon was northern Greece, that you would call northern Greece today. Philip was the father of Alexander the Great. And it says who came out of the land of Chittim, had smitten Darius, king of the Persians and Medes. Okay, somebody real quick, Google Chittim. Isn't that that Cyprus? Real quick. I don't want to say it. In, and I think it's spelled K-I-T-T -T in the rest of the Bible. It is west Greece? coast of Cyprus. Oh, Cyprus, good, okay. So, Chittim is the west coast of Cyprus. Now, uh, I'll do a map later on one time, but you'll, I'll show you the, the, uh, where it's located. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, Samari, he's smitten Darius the king. Now, this is Darius the third in 331 BC, okay? Darius was the king of the Persians and Medes, all right? So, I'm gonna go back in history. Has any of you seen the movie 300? Yes, sir. Okay. That man you see there, his name was Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, all right? And you read about him where? Anybody know? He's in the Bible. I know people think the Bible is a fairy tale book. The Bible is a history book. Where do you read about that man, Xerxes, or, or Xerxes, I should say, or Ahasuerus? Just gave it away. Young man? The uh, Book of Esther. Right, the Book of Esther. So that same man you see in that movie, that's who this is talking, well, he was a descendant of this man here. 
So what happened, the reason I'm explaining that for is Persia began to push westward and they began to encroach on Greece. That's when you see Sparta and all those things talking about. They were pushing. And the Greeks were separate city-states. Sparta, Corinth, uh, Macedon, Olympus. And they all got together and fought against the Persians. Anyway, Persia beat them for the most part. And the payback was they, Philip the Macedonian wanted to war against them about 150, 60 years later to fight them for what they did. He never had a chance, but his son Alexander did. And Alexander fought this same man we're reading about, Darius III. He defeated him. All right, so let's read it. And that's from 331 BC. Read. And made many wars, and won many strongholds, and slew the kings of the earth, and went through to the ends of the earth, and took spoils of many nations, insomuch that the earth was quiet before him. Whereupon he was exalted, and his heart was lifted up. So Alexander began to move. Now he went eastward. He went as far as India. That's why you see down in Babylon, there's, there's Alexandria. Down in Egypt, Alexandria. He's named the lands after his name. Um, what's that, Psalms 49 and 11? Mm -hmm. Right, somebody just write that down with a good chance. Alexander pushed himself far east, and he came back. And we'll read about it. Let's read on and went to the ends of the earth and took spoils of many nations, and so much that the earth was quiet before him, whereupon he was exalted and his heart was lifted up. And he gathered a mighty stronghold and ruled over countries and nations and kings who became tributaries unto him. So unto Alexander, many nations became tributaries unto him. I mean, they paid taxes. Read on. And after these things, he fell sick and perceived that he should die. Wherefore he called his servants, such as were honorable, and had been brought up with him from his youth, and parted his kingdom among them while he was yet alive. So now, before he died, he went as far as India, and then he began to make his way back to Babylon. The same Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, and he died in Babylon. But prior to him dying, he parted his kingdom among the men that came up with him. Now, out of those men, there was four notable ones. Now, you can read about this also in the book of Daniel, the 8th chapter, Daniel, the 11th chapter. Daniel prophesied about this. In a later class, what I'll do is I will actually go back and explain what Daniel saw concerning this time period. Now, the four notable generals that took rulership was who? Does anybody know? Shamar? Okay. Ptolemy. Right. Uh, Lysimachus. Right. And Somebody can help him out? Cassandra. Cassandra. Cassandra, right. Now, here's the next question. What areas did those generals rule? Shadow. Uh, Lysimachus had Asia Minor, uh, Pergom uh, Pergomon. Uh, Cassandra had Greece and Macedonia. Ptolemy had Egypt and Libya. Libya. And uh, Seleucus. Seleucus had Syria and Persia. Right. And eventually Seleucus ended up taking over Asia Minor. Um, okay, very good. So those four generals took, his kingdom was split into four generals. And from those four men, they ruled as kings in those lands. All right, so let's read that verse again. So Alexander reigned 12 years and then died. And his servants bear rule every one in his place. And after his death, they all put crowns upon themselves. So did their sons after them many years. And evils were multiplied in the earth. Right. So after many years, these kings in those prospective lands, sons, sons ruled. And evils began to multiply. The evils were they began to Hellenize the people. Alexander's mind was to have everybody worship their gods. And you had many of Greeks. That's why you see Today, <laughs> we still have the same mind. America has the same mind. They want you to follow their customs, follow their ways. If you don't celebrate Christmas, Halloween, Mother's Day, Father's Day, 4th of July, you're ostracized. Back then, if you didn't follow their Greek gods, they would have killed you. 
So he Hellenized the people. And that's why when you read in Deuteronomy 28, 64, James 1 and 1, Peter's 1 and 1, 1 Corinthians 12 and 2, we became called, we became Gentiles, or we were called Gentiles. That's why when people read the New Testament, they get confused when Paul said there's no difference between Jew and Greek. They think that it means between Greek, meaning white people, or Greece, and the Jews. No. We're going to read about us becoming called Antiochians. We're called Greeks. Why? We follow their customs. Like you come from China, you come here and you follow American customs, they call you Chinese Americans. Same thing, all right? Bishop, man. Yeah, go feel free. Um, I want to speak, happy feast of dedication to all of you. Uh, I want to speak very briefly about the history of Alexander because a lot of the reading that we're getting right now is really the uh, precursor, so to speak, of Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. Um, Alexander and his reign, those were, those are really Esau's founding forefathers of white supremacy. Um, imperialism, all of that started under Alexander. When you're reading in his history, and this really goes to show how the Most High was working with our forefathers, these men were warriors. They, these men didn't play. They were wicked as hell, but they didn't play. When you read about Alexander, chronologically, in his teenage years, he sought out mentorship from Aristotle. His father, Philip the Macedonian, he was a warrior as well. And when you read a lot of times throughout history, it would tell you how these men would take arrows in the face, arrows in the eye, and they would still keep moving forward for global domination. Philip of Macedon, he stayed more so local to uh, the land of Cyprus and Greece. Alexander wanted to conquer the entire known world and he set out on a conquest to do that roughly around the age of 19. By the time that Alexander was in his early 30s, the majority of the known world at that time had been conquered under his reign. And you gotta think about the mindset of these heathen that went out to conquer these lands. Like Bishop Kanai said, this is a man that traveled all the way from Greece all the way to India. And there was no such thing as a bus. There was no such thing as a train. There was no such thing as an airplane. So these heathen, they were very intent on dominating the entire earth. So a lot of times when you see um, Esau, they seek to bomb other countries. They seek to establish democracy in all of these foreign lands. A lot of that comes from their predecessor right here who we're reading about in Alexander. These guys, they really did not play. Hey, but here's the thing, what you said, Cap. Uh, you know... And I'm glad you made that mention because it's sometimes it's hard to translate what you read to visualize it in your mind. You, you said something that he didn't, there was no bus or train. Mm -hmm. the, 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 and I'm just going to give you the miles from Greece to India. And it's still not even show you where he went all the way down into Ethiopia. Greece to India, put on the map. Yeah, it, it's not even show you where he went down into right. e e Egypt and Ethiopia was 3,596 miles. Mm -hmm. He ruled, and that's a straight line. He ruled everything in between there. Now, it might seem like a light thing, but it's one thing when you're able to travel that far, keep men fighting for you. No, he never made it back to Greece. He died in Babylon. But the whole point behind it was that the mind that Esau had about world domination was to make everybody to submit to their will. And today's the same thing. You can go to China, you can go to, you can go to India, and you'll see them with American customs, worshiping the white Jesus. That's the influence they pose upon the whole earth. Okay, so uh, let's go back real quick um, and first Maccabees, and then we're gonna jump around to put uh, the Maccabees in some chronological order, and then we're going to explain dedication. Okay, so we left in First Maccabees, the first chapter, and the ninth verse. Yes, sir. Verse 10. And there came out of them a wicked root, Antiochus, surnamed Epiphanes, son of Antiochus the king, who had been in hostage at Rome, and he reigned in the hundred and thirty and seventh year of the kingdom of the Greeks. So out of those four notable generals came a man by the name of Antiochus, Epiphanes. Epiphanes means God manifested on earth. He was a son of Antiochus the what they call the king, also known as Antiochus the Great. 
Let's go to, we're going to jump around real quick, hold this. And remember what it says, and he was a hostage at Rome. We're going to explain what was happening then. So let's go to uh, 1 Maccabees, the 8th chapter. And we're going to read, uh, I want verse 1. 1 Maccabees, chapter 8 and verse 1. Now Judas had heard of the fame of the Romans, that they were mighty and valiant men, and such as would lovingly accept all that joined themselves unto them, and make a league of amity with all that came unto them. Read. And that they were men of great valor. It was told him also of their wars and noble acts, which they had done amongst the Galatians, and how they had conquered them and brought them under tribute. And what they had done in the country of Spain. Also known as Gaul. Read on. For the winning of the mines of silver and gold, which is there. So if you remember, what was that movie with uh, Russell Crowe? Gladiator. Gladiator. You saw in the beginning was fighting those wars in the beginning. That was against the Gauls or the Spain. It was fighting for the mines of those lands. Now, mind you, we were talking about the Greeks, but now we're mentioning the Romans. And the reason why I want to mention the Romans for is because Rome is a little further on the map, a little further west than Greece. But Rome was on the rise now. By the time Alexander died, a few hundred, about a hundred and something years passed, then you had these four notable generals that were leading these land, ruling them, and then Rome was on the rise. So Judas heard of the, the fame of these Romans. The point I'm reading this for is about Alexander, I mean, Antiochus the Great, which is the father of Epiphanes. So we just read about the fame of Rome. Jump on down to verse 5. Verse 5. Beside this, how they had discomfited in the battle Philip and Persius, the king of uh, Kittim. Which is Cyprus. With others that lifted up themselves against them and, and had overcome them. How also Antiochus, the great king of Asia, that came against them in battle, having 120 elephants with horsemen and chariots and a very great army, was discomfited by them. Now, how Antiochus, this is the father of Epiphanes that we read about in chapter 1. So if you want to put the Maccabees in chronological order, you will read chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, then you will jump to chapter 8. So this man right here, Antiochus the Great, the king of Asia, he warred against the Romans and laws in 193. He took in Hannibal under his protection because Hannibal lost, was Second Punic War, was losing to Rome. And because of that, Rome took it as a threat and warred against Antiochus Epiphanes. I mean, Antiochus the Great on the third. Antiochus the Great lost the war. So let's read on down. <clears throat> Verse 7. And how they took him alive. And covenant that he and such as reigned after him should pay. Now, as he and such that reigned after him should do what? Should pay a great tribute and give hostages and that which was agreed upon. And give hostages. So when Antiochus III, which is the great loss, he had to pay tribute, but he also had to give hostages. The hostages was his son's. Let's go back to 1 Maccabees 1, verse 10. First Maccabees chapter 1, verse 10. And there came out of them a wicked root, Antiochus, surnamed Epiphanes, son of Antiochus the king, who had been in hostage in Rome. So we know that Antiochus Epiphanes at one time was a hostage in Rome. Let's, now, let's explain what happened. We're going to go to 2 Maccabees. Hold first, 2 Maccabees. We're going to read what happened prior to this. 2 Maccabees, the fourth chapter. Or let's, maybe the third chapter. We'll go a little further back. Let me see. 2 Maccabees. Okay, so I want you to write this down. There was Antios III, which is the great... And he had a son named Seleucus, or Seleucus. People call him Seleucus, all right? He had two sons, one named Seleucus, another one's Antiochus Epiphanes. We're going to read about the older son first. Um, Second Maccabees, the fourth chapter, verse 7. Second Maccabees, chapter 4, verse 7. 
But after the end of Seleucus, when Antiochus called Epiphanes took the kingdom, Jason, the brother of Onias, labored underhand to be high priest. Okay. But after the death of Seleucus, when Antiochus Epiphanes took the kingdom. So when you read 1 Maccabees, Antiochus Epiphanes was a hostage at Rome when his brother ruled Seleucus. When his brother died, Rome freed him and sent him back to Asia Minor. And the reason being was why. Does anybody know why they sent Epiphanes back? What was agreed upon with Rome that they had to do? They had to give a hostage and what? Pay tribute. So when his brother died, there would have been a power vacuum. Nobody's going to be the rule. So they raised that child up while he was a hostage in Rome so he can rule. So when his brother died, they sent him back. All right? Everybody following? Okay, good. Uh, now, in the same chapter, let's read. Uh, I'm going to explain something real quick. Uh, it says, after the death of Seleucus, when Antioch called the Pephes, took the kingdom, Jason, the brother of Onias, labored underhand to be high priest. So you had a high priest by the name of Simon III. He had two sons, Onias and Jason. Jason was a snake. He was Israelite, but he was a... He was... He would have been the equivalent of today, over who? Give me one of them. Uh, Al Sharpton. That's what he was pretty cool. It's cool. He underhandedly betrayed his brother to get the high priest's office. So let's go back. And we'll get into that as, because I'm not going to do it all in one night. Let's go back to 1 Maccabees. Chapter 1, verse 10, one more time. 1 Maccabees, chapter 1, and verse 10. And there came out of them a wicked root, Antiochus, surnamed Epiphanes, son of Antiochus the king, who had been in hostage at Rome. And he reigned in the hundred and thirty and seventh year of the kingdom of the Greeks. In those days went there out of Israel wicked men who persuaded many, saying, Let us go and make a covenant with the heathen that are round about us. So one of those wicked men was Jason. As we read about him, we're going to see he paid the Greeks, Antiochus, for the licensing to open up gymnasium. Everybody understand what gyms are today? What is a gym? Somebody know? A gymnasium? Oftentimes a workout area, I mean a workout place. It's a place where you exercise. It comes from the Greek word gymnos, which means to exercise naked. This was a Greek coax. Look up the word gymnos. Etymology, or just look up the word gymnos. That's why you go to a gym today and you see, for some reason, I don't know, old people be so checked out. Any other time, you would be ashamed to be nude around another person. And you go to the gym, and you stand there butt naked and shout, Hey, Chuck, how you been? You yeah. have some, you watch the elections? Right. And it's act like it's normal. Right. Only place, you, all day in school, you learn how to read, write, some arithmetic. Right. And then after football, we all stand in one big room with some water pouring down, and we all butt naked. <laughs> <laughs> Who does that? Who the hell does that but... The devil. Mm -hmm. So, does it give you the etymology of the word? It means Greek adjective meaning naked. Generally to train or to exercise. So, what you call gymnasium, that's why you see a lot of them sodomites used to be in the YMCA. <laughs> the bathhouses. That's a Greek custom. They would exercise naked. That has nothing to do with the children of Israel. For some reason, we cleave on to that culture. That's why I like to see them tight. Like, see when they play sports, they got them in tight spandex, crushing their nuts and short shorts, and girls be Olympics and they be in cat suits, jumping around, prancing around with camel toe. All right, think it's not real. Verse 12. 11, I'm sorry, yes. In those days went there out of Israel wicked men who persuaded many, saying, let us go and make a covenant with the heathen that are round about us. For since we departed from them, we have had much sorrow. Read. 
So this device pleased them well. Then certain of the people were so forward herein that they went to the king who gave them license to do after the ordinances of the heathen. And, and it says, and some of us went to the king to get license to do after the ordinances of the heathen. Read on. Whereupon they built a place of exercise at Jerusalem according to the customs of the heathen. Whereupon we built a place of exercise, just like the heathen. Hold this. Go to 2 Maccabees, the fourth chapter. Remember what I told you earlier. 2 Maccabees is just the same history that we're reading in 1 Maccabees. It just colors the picture in a little more for you. Uh, 2 Maccabees 4, verse 7 again. 2 Maccabees chapter 4 and verse 7. But after the death of Seleucus, when Antiochus called Epiphanes took the kingdom, Jason, the brother of Onias, labored underhand to be high priest, promising unto the king by intercession of 303 score talents of silver and of another revenue 80 talents. Beside this, he promised to assign 150 more if he might have license to set him up a place for exercise. And see, he promised the king that in paying him, give us the licensing so we can set up a place of exercise. We'll pay you off, King, if you allow us to set up a place so we can bring in your culture to our land. Read on. A place of exercise and for the training up of the youth in the fashions of the heathen, and to write them of Jerusalem by the name of Antiochians. Now, and that's another word of saying to train them up to call them or name them as Greeks. So here's the point behind it. It says, for the place of exercise, for the training up of youth in the fashion of the heathen, to raise up all young ones. In the and many of us was raised like that. We was raised up playing sports. Right. This is the ticket out of the hood. Play right. sports. It's the meal ticket. We were trained up in the fashion of thinking that you really wasn't a boy unless you played a sport. You are sissy if you, didn't, if you didn't try out for sport. Right. Mm -hmm. That was being groomed up in the fashion of the heathen. All right, so... The point I want out of this is that we had of our own people who want to join us onto the Greek custom. Try to understand this. The Greeks were ruling, they were controlling us. Rome was on the rise, controlling them. And it was just little old Israel in, in our land trying to make our way. And then we had of our own people who was conspiring with the heathen. But there was a set apart people amongst our people that was going to reject it that wasn't going to go for these customs even <coughs> till the death. All right, let's read on real quick. Um, name Antiochians, go to verse 10. Which when the king had granted and he had gotten in his hand the rule, he forthwith brought his own nation to the Greekish fashion. Right, and it brought us to the Greekish fashion. Hence we were called Greeks in the New Testament. That's why I said church, or how you finally call it, church. They don't teach you nothing about the Bible. Church is semantics and dancing and singing. No edification. Believe on Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Ha, 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 ha. The Bible is a history book. We can read about Alexander in here. We can read about Augustus Caesar in here. In their records, they have us. They have most. They have our names in the Bible. I mean, in their books. So people take the Bible like this. That's why church makes you dumb as a doorknob. Then when you get to the New Testament, you read about Paul. Paul says no difference between Jew and Greek. You have no idea what he's talking about because you never read the Bible. All you do is read hymn books and sing songs. The Bible is a book full of knowledge. Or if you want, we could just sing. And do, who got the tambourine? And, and give tithes and just... You go in and you can come out dumb of them before you went in there. You can tell first. You know I can't stand Christianity. Christianity is dangerous, boy, because all people in that day, they're going to be weeping and gnashing their teeth, have none understanding. That's why Christ said, I have some that's not of this fold. Them also must I bring in, because we're going to be scattered. Okay, that being said. Uh, jump on down to verse 14. Verse 14. 13. Verse 13. Now such was the, was the height of Greek fashions, 
an increase of heathenist manners. Homosexuality. Through the exceeding profaneness of Jason, that ungodly wretch and no high priest. So this was supposed to be the high priest Jason that was leading all people away from God into following heathenistic manners. That's just like, please do me a favor. I'm going to show you today's version of it. Pull up. What's the cool name again I said? Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton. Um, how do I say it again? Al Sharpton. Gay is okay. Gay is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's read this verse again while he finds it. Now such was the height of Greek fashions, an increase of heathenish manners through the exceeding profaneness of Jason, that ungodly wretch and no high priest. He was he was not he was supposed to be the high priest that led God's children into sin. Let's go down. I'll tell you what I see it. Right there, right there. No, not there, right there. That's it. Hi, I'm Reverend Al Sharpton, an American for marriage equality. As a Baptist minister, I don't have the right to impose my beliefs on anyone else. So if committed gay and lesbian couples want to marry, that's their business. None of us should stand in their way. Stop. He said, as a Baptist minister, I don't have a right. Well, damn it. I mean, isn't that in the Bible? Isn't Baptist mean to be baptized to be cleansed? And when you supposed to be cleansed from sin? God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, a whole lot of people burnt up for that. And he says, at the, as a Baptist minister, I don't have the right. You're supposed to have the authority. That's why church is a joke. I'm not even talking about dedication right now. Church is a joke. Yeah, go ahead. The precept. I know we're going somewhere, but it's Feel free. Feel free. I want to read um, Isaiah chapter 1 and 9 real quick, just to go along with what... Stay out of church. Um... This precept is heavy because it ties right in with what we're going over with the Al Sharpton thing and the increase of the heathenish customs. So stick with the thought. The thought is Esau is now on a mission of worldwide domination, white supremacy. And with that, the Sodom agenda is being turned up full. That's why the gymnasiums are being established in the first place. That's why the women are being trained on the island of Lesbos. But look what the prophet Isaiah says when you read Isaiah 1 and 9. Somebody got it? I got it. The book of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. So that's something very heavy for us to ponder on. A lot of you brothers, because um, you know, like when we were growing up in the world, or even now, you know, it's gay is a taboo thing. Nigga, you gay. You know what I mean? Like that would be something that you would kind of shy away from. But what the Lord is bringing out here through the prophet Isaiah is that if the Lord would have not left a small remnant of men, like what we're going to read about in the book of Maccabees and so on, our forefathers that fought against Jason and all the Edomites, every last one of our people would have been in the midst of homosexuality. Every last sister would have been a lesbian. Had it not been for God's word and God's elect, this entire earth would be one big orgy, one big gay fest, one big gay orgy, one big lesbo orgy. That's why y'all don't understand. We're the most powerful men that have ever been created on the face of the earth. That's right. That's the reason why the Bible says that the law was made for the Israelites' sake. That's why Paul said that uh, the perfect manifestation is waiting on the sons of God. We're the turning point of everything here under Christ. Because if it had not been for the Lord leaving us as a remnant, this earth would have been far more out of the course than it is today. It wouldn't even be here. I hope you understand what the captain just said. We are the vanguards to make change on this earth. Because you can't, you can't depend on the church. Church can have to fail, 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 fail. You can't, you certainly can't. I mean, at one time, the Christian church, at least they... With a fake like they had more knowledge, the first man and his first man. I mean, and the pastor. His name is Peter. We got a first lady room on the church. <laughs> anyway, let's go back because I'm digress. Okay, so uh, verse 4 of 2 Maccabees. 2 Maccabees chapter 4, verse 14. 
that the priests had no courage to serve anymore at the altar, but despising the temple and neglecting the sacrifices, hastened to be partaker of the unlawful allowance in the place of exercise. After the game of discus called them forth. And the game of discus, if you've seen the old image, would be a naked guy throwing what you call a frisbee. That's what they, they say, you know what? We're not going to keep the Sabbath. We're going to watch basketball. We're going to go play ball. We're not going to keep the Sabbath. We're going to play football. Who do you got? We stop doing God's laws to follow the ways of the heathen. That's why in society today, everything is set up against us keeping God's laws. And we're the only standards. And honestly, I would hope to speak for everybody here. We really don't care. I don't give a damn what the world's doing. I don't care if you don't like it anyway. Just like all four of us. They didn't give a damn what the world was. So what? We must stand for the laws of God. Watch this. We don't. Yeah. So with, uh, with the comment you made about us being vanguards and with uh, you saying we're going to stand for the word of the Lord, can that go into uh, 1 Maccabees chapter 2, verse 67 and 68, where uh, Matthias told Judas to take all those who also serve the Lord with you and uh, recompense fully the heathen and take heed to the commandments of the Lord? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, when we finish this, we're going to get back to trying to get to the feast of dedication eventually. Uh, but yes, absolutely you can use that. Uh, verse 50. Not saying by the honors of their fathers, but like in the glory of the Grecians, best of all. We didn't like oh, we didn't like what we had. We liked what the Greeks were doing. We wanted to follow their customs. Like today, why in the world would anybody, just, just on, on the most basic of levels, how can we say that we love God and Jesus the Christ? The real Jesus, not that imposter. The real Jesus Christ of the Bible. How can you say that we love him and we will not keep the high holy days of the Bible? Like today. Like the Sabbath day. How do we do How do we say we love him and we find ourselves so many Christians? But Christmas has nothing to do with it. And when you say it, you say, well, that's not what it means to me. That's a stupid, sottish mind. How do you say we love God and don't do the basic things that he asks? We like the custom of the heathens. Here we go. In July 4th, 1776, 1776, 1776, we were slaves. And for some reason, on July 4th, 2016, like, I'm getting barbecue sauce two for a dollar. Who got the fireworks? We the only people that do dumb stuff that we saw. And church has done it to us. And then when you say this, you become the bad guy. Well, damn it, I'm the bad guy. It's the truth. We says, but not setting the honors of their fathers, but liking the glory of the Grecians best of all. We love their ways over what God has given us. And thus we're in captivity. Deuteronomy 28, verse 47, 48. Somebody, have somebody read that for me. So what I'm trying to do, hopefully through the Spirit, is stir all people up to start really considering, looking at themselves, and on these days, when we read the history of what our forefathers did, <laughs> we'd love to stand in the presence of men like that. These men was not playing. Deuteronomy chapter 28. What's the little short comic guy? Kevin Hart. These was no Kevin Hart's. These men were not no court gestures and <laughs> clowns. That's what these men were. These men loved God, and they was defending and killing in God's name. Please don't go out to kill them. Don't be stupid now. They stood up for the laws of God. Read. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Because we would not serve the God that chose us above all nations. I know church taught you that God loves everybody. That's a lie. Lie, 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 lie. The Bible was written by the Israelites, for the Israelites, to the Israelites, about the Israelites. And everybody else was just chum. If you know what that means. We were just there for feed. Cattle. God destroyed the nations for the Israelites. Held back the sun for the Israelites. Killed the firstborn of Egypt for the Israelites. And what we read today, what he did to the, to the Greeks, he did it for the Israelites. Show me anywhere in the Bible where God killed the Israelites for the other nations. Right. <laughs> I missed that chapter. It's not in the Bible. Read that verse again. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. You know why? 
We didn't serve because we liken the ways of the other nations best. We wanted to be like them. And God said, damn, I chose you all. I gave you everything. And you still think there's something better than me out there? Well, take your black backside and go into captivity. Let's see how you like that. <coughs> Speak their bastard languages. Celebrate their days. And let them clock you over the head and lock your black backside up. And then you're going to call a white Jesus. But I'm going to send the prophets back on the earth. And they're going to bring all these things back to your remembrance. And then hopefully you bethink yourselves and repent. And come back and celebrate the days that I've given you. Thank me for all things. Instead of Obama. <laughs> Bishop. Glory to Grecians, best of all. That, that covers a wide span when the scriptures are talking about that. You see that a lot of times even in the media. There was one thing that just came out. Uh, Jay-Z had this song called Tom Ford. Like a, a, lot of, a lot of rappers, what they do, they'll make songs and lyrics about fashion, alcohol, cars, all these type of things. But then when you actually examine the people that they're repping in these songs, yeah. they're wicked as hell. This guy, Tom Ford, just went on record, Bishop, saying, he said, I feel that every man at one time in their life at least should get penetrated. So that way, a man who understands. Who, 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 who. Who's Tom Ford? Uh, like a fashion type oh, guy. Oh. Like those Ralph Lauren, those oh. type of guys. Oh, okay. He said, and Jay-Z has a song about it. Remember how the bishop was going over yes, was yes, one yes, witchcraft? Yes. So yes. on the exact same album, he has a song called Tom Ford. And this Tom Ford guy, he just came out on record saying that every single man, this is an Edomite, by the way, every single man in their lifetime should get penetrated so that way they understand the vulnerability of a woman when she gets penetrated. <laughs> That's wicked as hell, man. And you know what? The worst part about that? There was a stupid Negro said, you know, that makes sense. <laughs> I, never, I never saw that perspective before. Doesn't mean I'm gay, right? Nigga, you gay. Oh, God. What did God say? If you like a man like you like him, you're abomination. So I want to jump on down to 1 Maccabees 1, uh, verse 41. First Maccabees chapter 1, verse 41. Moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people, and every one should leave his laws. So all the heathen agreed according to the commandment of the king. And that's that one world order. Everybody leave what they believe and follow the ways of the Greeks. Read on. Yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion. That's called a coup. Many of us consented and said, yeah, we're going to do... Give me that... Oh, forget, I forget, I, I don't want to take the class too far. That's a coup. We left... Many of our own people left what they were doing in God's laws to follow the ways of the other nation. Read on. And sacrifice unto idols, and profane the Sabbath. For the king had sent letters by messengers unto Jerusalem, and the cities of Judah, that they should follow the strange laws of the land, and forbid burnt offerings, and sacrifice, and drink offerings in the temple, and that they should profane the Sabbaths and festival days, and pollute the sanctuary and holy people, set up altars and groves and chapels of idols, and sacrifice swine's flesh, and unclean beasts that they should also leave their children uncircumcised and make their souls abominable with all manner of uncleanness and profanation. All manner of uncleanness. So the point of Antiochus was saying, everybody leave their laws, sacrifice swine's flesh. So now to back then, we're going to see many more forefathers uh, consented, but you had many that would not consent to it, that went to their death not doing it. Today, we openly be eating pork. Now, mind you, many of us didn't know it. But then when the ones, you, that's what I said, church make you dumb because you say, well, let's go to law. The most I said, we're not supposed to eat swine's flesh. They would say, you can't judge me. Right. <laughs> well, yes, I can't judge you. I'm not condemning you. I'm telling you, you got to repent. Well, everything God made is good, nothing to be refused. <laughs> All these semantics, how about just keep the law? And then when you got gout, when your heart is clogged up, then you call him for Jesus. Lord Jesus, help me do it. Bring the prayer warriors to the church, I mean to the hospital. Right. Y'all stand over me and pray for 18 hours. 
Maybe you should have stopped eating pork 18 years ago. Right. <laughs> it's simple. You say, you say God's going to judge you. Yes, he's going to judge you. Yes. So the point, many of us consented to it. To the end, this is the point. Uh, to the end, they might forget the law and change all the ordinances. It says to the end, they wanted you to eat unclean beasts, to stop circumcising your children, to not keep the laws. To the end. So their purpose was not for that day. It was a long-term plan. Give me that in Wisdom of Solomon, Ungodly Custom 14, I think I see the chapter 7 or chapter 14. So their plan wasn't a plan for that day. It was a plan to affect your children's 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 children. They had long, thank you please. Kat, you want some water? They, they had long-term plan to pull us away to the end that we might I'm sorry, I took my glass off. And that we might forget the law. You know what it takes to forget something? You have to be rehearsing the wrong thing for so long that you, that you drop dead, your kids grow up, and they learn it, and they learn it, and they learn it. And an ungodly custom, we're going to read in a second, grow strong, becomes like it's a law. Like read. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14 and verse 16. Thus, in process of time, an ungodly custom grown strong was kept as a law. Now watch this. I'm going to show you an ungodly custom that is grown strong, is kept as a law. Jeremiah the 10th chapter. Very simple one. Because it's coming up, it's befitting. And many more people find themselves doing this. And for some reason, they'll try to rationalize it in their mind. Now I'm not, well I am going to explain it, but I'm going to make it very simple. Read Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 1. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Here's simple. Do not learn something. Everybody understand that, right? Yes, sir. Don't learn something God said. We don't. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. And don't be confused by the signs of heaven, the sun, the moon, the stars. For the heathen are dismayed at them. Because the other nations are confused by them. They look at the sun, the moon, the stars, and they say, ah, oh, look, my God, God robbed. We see the sun, oh, it's light. They look at it and say, oh, this is what made me. Read on. For the customs of the people are vain. Vain mean useless, lies. The custom of these people are a lie. Read on. For one cut of the tree out of the forest. Here's the custom. You cut a tree out the forest. The work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. And then the hand of the axe, the workman, he cuts it down. They deck it with silver and with gold. And then after he cuts it down, he decorates it. They fasten it with nails and hammers that it move not. And then they prop it up so it don't fall over. Now tell me what day that is. Come on, that's simple. I mean, you, if you don't say Christmas, it's because the gospel's hid from you. If you say anything else, or you say, I don't see it, then you're in a different, you're in a different stratosphere. God has to... God bless your soul. That's why, because you got to be retarded if you can't understand. Somebody cut a tree, they decorate, and they prop it up that it don't fall over, and you telling me it's Arbor Day. <laughs> God said, don't do it. And over a period of time, today, everybody, you have you go to church right now, and the pastor say, Sister Mary, you don't have a tree? Get him, Sister Mary, tree is hanging. <laughs> what else, please help me, what else day it could be? I'm not sure. I'm thinking of any other day in the world that could be other than Christmas. Nothing strikes anybody here? Birthday? Yeah, right. <laughs> this is a moon. Then I have a, so, so. But it will grow strong, and today all people will celebrate that. And you know what? I don't give two rats behind if the whole world's doing it. You're evil, and you're the devil, and you need to repent. Right. And I don't care if you don't like it. So what? I'm telling you, to be an Israelite, you got to be a strong resolve. Mm -hmm. It's easy to be wicked because everybody wicked. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be righteous because the masses are going to be against you. Right. It takes a certain resolute and spirit to say, whatever. <laughs> so over, over a period of time, what you call Christmas today, God said don't do it. That dates back to Babylon. That's even before Christ was even born. Church make you stupid. And America make you wicked. I'm pissed off. I need to get happy again. All right, let me read some. Let me read about the destruction of these nations, cause and they can they irritate me. All right, let's let's upbeat it. Where do we leave off at? To the end. Uh, 
No, drop that. Give me uh, 1 Maccabees 1, 49. 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verse 49. To the end that they might forget the law and change all the ordinances. So the reason why they implemented these things to the end that we might forget the law. To the end. So their plans were long-term plans. Plots to deceive us. Plots to destroy us. Psalms 83. And the scripture says, surely oppression makes a wise man mad. So if you ain't mad, you ain't wise. <laughs> Psalms 83 and 1. Psalms chapter 83, verse 1. Keep not thou silence, O God. That's what I'm asking, Father. Be not silent, God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult. God, your enemies are making an uproar. And they that hate thee have lifted up thy head. And the enemies, your nations that hate thee, has lifted up their head against you in pride. Read on. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. And they have plotted against your people. Read on. And consulted against thy hidden ones. And we are the hidden ones that they have consulted. All, how is it that wherever you go, we as a people, I mean, mind you, black and black crime, we are the devil ourselves in our own right, the stuff we do. And like we innocent. But you're going to tell me that you think we're the dumbest people in the world? All the stuff we created, all the stuff? Why can't we get ahead? Why is it that we're not able to move forward? You can get people to, we can go bomb Vietnam or whatever. They can come over here and within 20 years, they own properties, commercial properties, homes. They send their kids to COVID. How is it that we are always behind? Because the nations have plotted against us. And we have sinned against God. Go ahead, Captain. And a lot of these, uh, the crafty council, going back again to the media, is based upon a lot of this rap world that y'all are familiar with. Um, that was this Edomite historian. His name was Will Durant. Um, he wrote a book called The Story of Civilization. Because, um, you know, a lot of times, when you read in the back of these, a lot of Esau pushes a philosophy that civilization starts with the Greeks. So a lot of his writings was predicated around uh, Greek philosophy. But as he had studied the history of the Greeks, he said, um, nations are born Stoic and die Epicurean. Meaning that when empires come into power, it takes people who are willing to deny everything for a greater good and a long-term gain. That was the philosophy of the Stoics. That manifested itself later, back to what Bishop was saying with the manifest destiny. Esau, who was willing to sacrifice everything, to travel to the Western world, to have our people in oppression and slavery. But then it says, in those same empires, they will die Epicurean. The Epicureans, that comes from Greece. How many of y'all are familiar with, um, in the rap world, you, what they call YOLO, by show of hands? YOLO. You only live once. That's based upon the history of the Epicureans. Drake and Lil Wayne, they didn't make that up. That came from an, a, a, an Epicurean agenda. The Epicureans during their time period in Greece said, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And this is the reason why many of today's rappers and many of our people all across the world, they will take their last dollar, spend it on tennis shoes, spend it on drugs, spend it on weed, whatever, and they'll say, YOLO, I'm living it. Uh-oh, Molly, YOLO. Y'all don't realize, and, and we will run ourselves into the ground, die at an early age with nothing to show for it, thinking that this is the way that life is supposed to be lived. Y'all don't realize that even when you're following after that, what you think you're getting from your own brother, the YOLO movement, that comes from the so-called white man's doctrine. That comes from the time of the Epicureans. Because like Deacon Yawasop always say, you might be hearing a black man do the lyrics of a rap record, but who's the one that's really talking? It's the white man's satellite that's planted in the back, black man's brain, and you think you're doing something new. So for a lot of you young men, you go and dabble out into the world and going, oh, look at me, you, YOLO. You're following after the way of the Greeks the same way Jason did. All right, so let's go back. Uh, so let's finish Psalms 83. Psalms chapter 83 and verse 4. They have said, 
Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Now go back. I want you to remember that the name of Israel be no more in the remembrance. And it were. Today we call ourselves African Americans, Puerto Ricans, Black, Hispanic, all these bywords that God never called us. That the name of Israel be no more remembrance. Remember, remembrance, remembrance, no more remembrance. Go back to 1 Maccabees 1 49. 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verse 49. To the end that they might forget the law and change all the ordinances. And that's the point, that we might forget who we are. But God said in the last days, he's going to raise up the true prophets. That's going to come back and bring out these scriptures to so you all can bethink yourselves and remember, you know what, I'm not African American, I'm an Israelite. Right. Let's go back to 1 Maccabees 1. I want to read a little bit now. Let me read. 1 Maccabees 1, verse 50. And whosoever would not do according to the commandment of the king, he said, should die. In the same self in the safe in the self same manner, he wrote he to the whole kingdom and appointed overseers over all the people, commanding the cities of Judah to sacrifice city by city. Then many of the people were gathered unto them to whip everyone that forsook the law, and so they committed evils in the land, and drove the Israelites into secret places, even wheresoever they could for succor or safety. Now, the 15th day of the month, Kaslu, which is the ninth month of the year, I think like, that's like some place in like um, Zephaniah, something like that. Okay. And the 15th day of the month, Kaslu, the 145th year, they set up abomination of desolation upon the altar, built, built an idol altars throughout the city of Judah on every side. So what did they do? On this day, they went into the temple, the Most High God, and they set up altars to worship their gods. They came, they came to the city, set up their place, and built it. Now watch this. Let's read about why, because you think it's just they set up a little statue and that was it. No, 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 no. Not so simple. Let's go to 2 Maccabees, the 6th chapter. Verse 1. Read that from the cabinet. 2 Maccabees 6 and 1. Not long after this, the king sent an old man of Athens to compel the Jews to depart from the laws of their fathers and not to live after the laws of God Read. and to pollute also the temple in Jerusalem and to call it the temple of Jupiter Olympius and that in gar garrison of Jupiter the defender of strangers as they did desire that dwelt in the place. Read. The coming of this, the coming in of this mischief was sore and grievous to the people, for the temple was filled with riot and reveling by the Gentiles, who dallied it with harlots and had to do with women within the circuit of the holy places. So now it says, in, it says verse four, the temple was filled with riot and reveling. So they, reveling is they were going into worshiping Bacchus. Amongst Benjamin, we call it Bacchanal, where it's a big carnival. You do it down in Mardi Gras, where they drink and they get stupid, they lift the top and show their breasts and all kind of debauchery and evil. So it says, in the temples filled with riot and reveling by the Gentiles who dallied with harlots and had to do with women within the circle of the holy place, besides that brought in things that were not lawful. So the Most High's temple, they went into homosexuality and to hoard them into eating unlawful meats, it became a brothel. This was inside the Most Highest Place. Now watch this. I'm going to read about, let's, let's go back a little bit. Let's go to Psalms real quick. Hold this, Psalm 74. Remember we read about, uh, back here it says, the, the abomination that made desolate. You can find that in Daniels, but we're going to read about it in Psalms because ASAP, wrote about it also. Psalm 74, verse 3. Psalm chapter 74, verse 3. Lift up thy feet unto the perpetual desolations, even all that the enemy hath done wickedly in the sanctuary. Read on. Thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. They set up their ensigns for signs. So what was Asaph the prophet doing? He was prophesying about what was going to happen in the temple. And he wrote it in music. Back then when we made music, all music was prophesying. We were speaking about what was going to happen. 
we would pray to God to bring deliverance and destroy our enemies. That was always Psalms. Today, what you sing, you sing about, you remind me of a Jeep. So let's go back to 2 Maccabees chapter 4, verse 5. Second Maccabees. Six, chapter six, verse five. Second Maccabees, chapter six, verse five. The altar also was filled with profane things, which the law forbiddeth. Neither was it lawful for a man to keep Sabbath days or ancient feasts, or to profess himself at all to be a Jew. And in the day of the king's birth every month, they were brought by bitter constraint to eat of the sacrifices. And when the feast of Bacchus was kept, the Jews were compelled to go in procession to Bacchus carrying ivy. And that's back to what you call carnival today. Well, they was forced to, to go in procession to worship Bacchus. Bacchus was the god of reveling and drunkenness. All right? So let's go back. Now, mind you, all this is happening in Jerusalem. Let's go back now and start putting together what was happening uh, with Judas Maccabeus and his father and brethren. So we're going to go to... 1 Maccabees, chapter 1, verse 59. 1 Maccabees, chapter 1, verse 59. Now the five and twentieth day of the month they did sacrifice upon the idol altar, which was upon the altar of God, at which time, according to the commandment, they put to death certain women that had caused their children to be circumcised. And they hanged the infants about their necks and rifled their houses and slew them that had circumcised them. Watch this. Uh, go to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 50. A nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. So what did they do to the women? They killed the women. They killed the babies. They hung them by their necks. Because they were circumcised. They showed no mercy. This was a punishment. God said, you, don't, you forsake me. And you don't want to serve me. All right, I'm gonna, this is what I make your enemies do to you. Destroy you. Kill your women. Rape your women. Hang them. Kill your children. Back. First Maccabees. First Maccabees chapter 1, verse 62. Howbeit many in Israel were fully resolved and confirmed in themselves not to eat any unclean thing. And that's what the captain was talking about, that there was a remnant of people with all this happening, with the dallying, with the harlots in the temple, with the killing, with the, with the hangings, that there was a group of Israelites that was resolved that whatever is going on, they're going to stand for the laws of God. And do you know those people are back on the earth today? They're back here right now. That same regular people that they don't care what the, the known world is doing, they're going to keep God's laws. Read on. Wherefore they chose rather to die that they might not be defiled with meats, and that they might not profane the holy covenant, so then they died. So they were willing to die. Today we got young youth that die over colors. <laughs> All four fathers dying over standing for God's laws, mm. for not to eat pork, for circumcised, knowing that I'm a. The God's laws where I was supposed to circumcise my son. And in circumcising, it might cause me to lose my life. My son loses life. My wife loses life. But we were keeping the laws of God. Now, let's jump on down. Let me read a little bit. Chapter 2, verse 1. It says, In those days rose Mattathias, the son of John, the son of Simeon, the priest of the son of Jorib, uh, Jorib from Jerusalem, and dwelt in Molden. Molden was Molden was a city that was north west of Jerusalem. All right, he was a priest in that land. And he had five sons: Johanan called Cadus, Simeon, Simon called Thassi, Judas called Maccabeus, Eleazar called Avran, and Jonathan, whose surname was Aphas. It says, and when he saw the blasphemies that were committed in Judah, in Jerusalem, he said, "Woe is me! Wherefore I was born to see the misery of my people." People. So now remember what he says. He saw what was being committed. We just read about that, about the temple being defiled. Verse 7. And he said, Woe is me, wherefore I was born to see the misery of my people and of the holy city and to dwell there when it was delivered into the hand of the enemy and the sanctuary into the hand of strangers. Her temples become 
as a man without glory. Her glorious vessels are carried away into captivities. Her infants are slain in the streets. Her young men with the sword of the enemy. Then it says, what nation hath not part of her kingdom and gotten of her spoils? It says, which nation haven't taken part in destroying us? All nations of this earth. We always say Esau, the white man. Chinese, East Indians, Africans, all of them have taken part in destroying God's children. We just read that in Psalms 83, that they were confederate against us. That's why when you see Ham or the so-called African come to the Americas, they don't deal with Negroes. They're able to, they're able to navigate here better than we are. That's why you see the Chinese come in. They don't deal with you. Just, you just buy their food. All of them has gotten a vote spot. All of them has taken part in the destruction of the children of Israel. It says, verse 11, all her ornaments are taken away for of a free woman she has become a bond slave. And behold, our sanctuary, even our beauty of our glory is laid waste and the Gentiles profaned it. So I read all that to get to that point. That the temple was profaned. All right? This whole thing is the dedication of us rededicating our forefathers, rededicating it back to the Most High. Uh, let me jump on down. I'm trying to cut this short now. No, I can't. Verse 13. To what end, therefore, shall we live any longer? That Matthias and his sons rent their clothes and put on sackcloths and mourn very sore. In the meanwhile, while the king's officers, such as compelled the people to revolt, came into the city of Modin to make them sacrifice, and when many of the Israelites came unto them, Mattathias also and his sons came together. Then answered the king's officers and said to Mattathias, on this wise, Thou art a ruler, an honorable and great man in this city, strengthened with sons and brethren. Now therefore, come thou first and fulfill the king's commandment like all the heathen have done, yea, the men of Judah also, and such as remain in Jerusalem, re remain at Jerusalem, so shalt thou and thy house be in the number of the king's friends, and thou and thy children shall be honored with silver, gold, and many rewards. So the king's messenger told him, listen, sacrifice these gods. Everybody knows you. You're a great man here in the city, and you're going to be a friend of the king, and the king is going to pay you for this. Mattathias answered and spake with a loud voice, for all the nations that are under the king's dominion, obey him and fall everyone from his uh, from the religion of their fathers and give consent to his commandments. Yet will I and my son and my brethren walk in the covenant of our fathers. God forbid that we should forsake the law and ordinances. We will not hearken unto the king's word to go out from our religion, either to the right hand or to the left. Now we just read that, but understand that when that messenger came, he came with an army. It wasn't like he came by himself. He came with an army. And man, that is like, listen, me and my sons, we ain't doing it. I don't care what the king said. And don't think we're going to go to left or the right or we're going to negotiate or we're going to compromise. We ain't doing it. Period. Now after he said all this, now when he had left speaking these words, there came one of the Jews of, in the sight of all to sacrifice on the altar which is at Modin according to the, command, the king's commandment. So as he's saying this, here coming the coon that's coming to go sacrifice on the altar that Mattathias, the high the, the, the priest in that city, is like, this is what we sacrifice all the time. I'll be damned if you think we gonna sacrifice there. And I just said that, and as I'm saying it, somebody has some cool sacrifice there at the same period. Which when Mattathias saw, he was inflamed with zeal, and his reins trembled, neither could he forbear to shoot his anger according to the judgment, wherefore he ran and slew him upon the altar. Mattathias, he lost his mind, and he killed that man for doing it. Now watch this. Also the king's commissioner, who compelled men to sacrifice, he killed at that time, and the altar was pulled down. So at that point, he said, I'm already fully in it. <laughs> I might as well just kill him too. And he killed the king's officer. Now this is where the war begins. Because that officer don't go back. The king's like, where's the man I sent? Mm -hmm. You kill the officer is as though you're killing the king. So now the king has to respond now. Now mind you, Mattathias, he was a man of renown. He was known in the city. He had his home, his family, his cattle. He was, you know, he was established. He wasn't a vagabond. 
His life turned upside down. Verse 26. Thus he dealt zealously for the law like Phineas did unto Zabri, the son of Salom. That's back in Numbers 25. And just reading it again. Verse 27. And Mattathias cried throughout the city with a loud voice, saying, Whosoever is zealous of the law and maintaineth the covenant, let him follow me. And he and his sons fled into the mountains and left all that they had in the city. So at that moment, in a split second, Mattathias' life and his son's life changed. He just killed the king's commissioner. It ain't go home and now uh, let's sit down and let's think of what we're going to do. And listen, turn the game. Mm -hmm. you know, hey, babe, can you make something to eat? You know, we're gonna... No, it's time to flee. This is how a forefathers was. All that he accumulated, he counted as dumb, as nothing, and left it. Flee me, he had to leave. Many of us hold on to our earthly possessions like a, oh, this is an iPhone 94. Look, like this. Oh, don't drop it. Like, you know. like, all forefathers would laugh at us today. We're so petty and so small-minded. You understand when he left, he's talking about he's leaving, pulling his wife, his children, grandchildren, goat, whatever he can, and that's it? Everything gets left back? Not like you go and you, now you know, listen, Babe, I want you to set up a, get us a room at the, uh, at the La Quinta. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to stay there for yeah. a week. <laughs> the day's in. <laughs> Second back of 527. Thank you for the script. This is what I was talking about. Second Maccabees chapter 5, verse 27. But Judas Maccabeus with nine others, or thereabout, withdrew himself into the wilderness and lived in the mountains after the manner of beasts with his company, who fed on herbs continually, lest they should be partakers of the pollution. You understand? They live like beasts. Shout love this. I know he like this. Says she look at he like I'm ready for this. <laughs> Bring on that. I roll with shallow because trust me, he, in that bag he got everything. <laughs> everything is in that bag. Uh, let's go back. Verse twenty eight. I'll read it. Uh, Second Maccabees two twenty eight. So he and his son fled into the mountains and left all that. Ever they had in the city. They left everything they had. And many, and then it says, Then many that sought after justice and judgment went down into the wilderness to dwell there. Both they and their children and their wives and their cattle, because of affliction, increased so upon them. You understand that? They uprooted their families. Everybody want to stand for the laws of God. They took their babies and they was walking through. It was no, I don't think there's like no bathrooms and no, you know, paved roads. Imagine trying to walk, trying to take a newborn baby and walk him through whatever he's walking through and got your cattle trying to make your way. All this for the life. We live such a cush life. Many of us couldn't make it a week with what they're doing. <laughs> Listen, many of the men today would die off before the women back then would have died off. Who would have outlast the men today? Half a men, half a sissies anyway. <laughs> All right. So let's jump to chapter four. I'm going to speed it up now. Now, I'm going I'm to explain some of it. And that's why sometimes, it, I, like, you want to, you don't want to jump because it's so much, I feel like I'm, I'm trying to paint the picture and there's so much that we're missing. But anyway, what happened now, Antiochus Epiphanes was pissed off. And he said, I'm going to pay my whole army money up for a year up front. I want them dead. I want Judas and them dead. He was going broke. So he was going to go into Persia to go get some money. He left his, one of his blood royal, Lysias, with half the army to destroy Judas. Lysias sent men to go after Judas. All right? And we're going to read chapter 4, and we're going to explain the Feast of Dedication. 4-1. First Maccabees 4 and 1. Then took Gorgias 5,000 footmen and a thousand of the best horsemen and removed out of the camp by night to the end that he might rush in upon the camp of the Jews and smite them suddenly. And the men of the fortress were his gods. Now when Judas heard thereof, he himself removed and the valiant men with him 
that he might smite the king's army, which was at Emmaus, while as yet the forces were dispersed from the camp. In the mean season came Gorgias by night into the camp of Judas. And when he found no man there, he sought them in the mountains. Now, but, mind you, I'm sorry to cut you off. The mean season mean the winter time. So you had your family out there in the winter. Read on. For said he, these fellows flee from us. But as soon as it was day, Judas shewed himself in the plain with 3,000 men, who nevertheless had their had neither armor nor swords to their minds. So Judas had 3,000 men, and he had 3,000 men that never had their mind to sword. They were not soldiers. These were farmers. These were cattlemen, herdsmen. They didn't know war, but it was 3,000 of them going up against an organized army of men. That This is what they do. They, they fight. Some of these men were mercenaries. They were paid. This is what they paid. They paid soldiers. They paid to fight. Read on. And they saw the camp of the heathen, that it was strong and well harnessed, and compassed round about with horsemen, and these were experts of war. Then said Judas to the men that were with him, Fear ye not their multitude, neither be ye afraid of their assault. Remember how our fathers were delivered in the Red Sea, when Pharaoh pursued them with an army. Now therefore let us cry unto heaven, if peradventure the Lord will have mercy upon us and remember the covenant of our fathers and destroy this host before our face this day, that so all the heathen may know that there is one who delivereth and saveth Israel. Then strangers lifted up their eyes and saw them coming over against them. Wherefore they went out of the camp to battle but they were with Judas sound but they that were with Judas sounded with trumpets. So they joined battle, and the heathen being discomfited fled into the plain. Howbeit all the hinds most of them were slain with the sword, for they pursued them unto Gazera, and unto the plains of Idumea, and Azaz, and Jamnia, so that there were slain of them upon a three thousand men. So these, there were 3,000 men that didn't know nothing about war. And Judas exhorted them to trust in the Most High and give them examples of our forefathers. And they, I mean, it sounds like just words. They killed 3,000 men. The same number that they were. They killed 3,000 men, men that never warred before. You understand psychologically how it would change your perspective. How you start seeing yourself in a different light. That damn, we can do this. You understand? They're fighting against a few thousand men. Is fighting against the Greek army and able to win a battle. We don't. And said to the people, "Be not greedy of the spoils, and as much as there is a battle before us, and Gorgias and his host are here by us in the mountain." But stand ye now against our enemies and overcome them. And after this, ye may boldly take the spoils. As Judas was yet speaking these words, there appeared a part of them looking out of the mountain, who when they perceived that the Jews had put their host to flight and were burning the tents, for the smoke that was seen declared what was done. When therefore they perceived these things, they were so afraid. And seeing also the host of Judas in the plain ready to fight, they fled every one into the land of strangers. Then Judas returned to spoil the tents, where they got much gold and silver and blue silk and, blue and purple of the sea and great riches. After this, they went home and sung a song of thanksgiving and praised the Lord in heaven. Because it is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Thus Israel had a great deliverance that day. Now all the strangers that had escaped came and told, told Lysias what had happened. Who, when he had heard thereof, was confounded and discouraged. Because neither such things as he would, as he would were done unto Israel. Now Lysias was the king's uh, blood royal. His family, he was left in charge. So he sent Gugias out. And when he heard he lost, he was confused. He's like, everything I proposed to happen to destroy him, how is it that these couple of men was able to defeat us? 
Read on. Nor such things as the kings commanded him will come to pass. The next year, therefore, following Lysias, gathered together threescore thousand choice men of foot and five thousand horsemen that he might subdue them. Listen, the following year he came with three score thousand. How much is, how much is one score? He came with three score thousand, 60,000 men, footmen, and 5,000 horsemen. 65,000 souls, men, to fight. Read on. So they came into Idumea and pitched their tents at Bethsura. And Judas met them with 10,000 men. So he, Judas had 10,000 men. That's six and a half men to every man. 10,000 men. Now, let me tell you something. I'm going to speak to my exhortation. You know what it is? The Spirit of God got to be on you to exhort mm -hmm. 10,000 men to look at 65,000 people and say, we can beat them? You know, at that moment, people be fleeing. That's what it says when you have the gift of exhortation. That's a gift from God when you're able to rally men to see unsurmountable odds and make them run. Did that like how you fight today when you be standing from behind and shooting a gun? You got to get close to kill them. Men, try to understand how valiant, how great our forefathers was. What kind of men these men had to be. The average man was a, was a god. We never picked up no sword like that. This is where the faith kick in. Yeah. The next year, therefore, following Lysias, gathered together three score thousand choice men afoot and five thousand horsemen that he might subdue them. So they came into Idumea and pitched their tents at Basura, and Judas met them with 10,000 men. So after that first victory, 7,000 more men joined. They start believing. Read on. And when he saw that mighty army, he prayed and said, Blessed art thou, O Savior of Israel, who didst quell the violence of the mighty man by the hand of thy servant David. And gave us the, the host of strangers into the hands of Jonathan, the son of Saul. Now, listen what he says. He says, and when he saw the mighty army, he prayed and said, Bless all thou, O Savior of Israel, who didst quell the violence of the mighty man by the hand of thy servant David, and gave us the host of strangers to the hand of Jonathan, the son of Saul, his armor bearer. You know what he's talking about here when he says that he, by the hand of David, he broke the mighty man? Second Samuel chapter 8. Second Samuel 8, 8 14. Second Samuel chapter 8, verse 14. And he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom put he garrisons. And all they of Edom became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. So he showed, he was praying to God, you already, by the hand of David, allow us to defeat the Edomites already. Allow it to happen again, Father. Allow it to happen again. Let us defeat them one more time. Let's go back. Verse 31. Shut up this army in the hand of thy people Israel. And let them be confounded in their power and horsemen. Make them to be of no courage and cause the boldness of their strength to fall away. And let them quake at their destruction. Cast them down with the sword of them that love thee. And let all those that know thy name praise thee with thanksgiving. So they joined battle and there were slain of the host of Lysias about 5,000 men. Even before them, they were slain. So out of that army, 5,000 men were put to death. By the, and remember, he had 65,000, so he lost 5,000. We don't. Now when Lysias saw his army put to flight, and the manliness of Judas' soldiers, and how they were ready to, and how they were ready either to live or die valiantly, he went into Antiochia and gathered together a company of strangers. And having made his army greater than it was, he purposed to come again into Judea. Then said Judas and his brethren, Behold, our enemies are discomfited, 
Let us go up to cleanse and dedicate the sanctuary. So after he defeated Lys Lysias, Lysias, Lysias left Antiochia, named after Antiochus, and he had to go try to gather together an army. During that time, Judas said, if that's the case, he's not here. Let's not go back and dedicate the altar back to the Most High. We don't. Upon this, all the hosts assembled themselves together and went up into Mount Zion. And when they saw the sanctuary desolate and the altar profaned and the gates burned up and shrubs growing in the courts as in a forest or in one of the mountains, yea, and the priest's chambers pulled down, they rent their clothes and made great lamentation and cast ashes upon their heads and fell down flat to the ground upon their faces and blew an alarm with the trumpets and cried toward heaven. Then Judas appointed certain men to fight against those that were in the fortress until he had cleansed the sanctuary. So he chose priests of blameless conversation, such as had pleasure in the law, who cleansed the sanctuary and bare out the defiled stones into an unclean place. And when they consulted what to do with the altar of burnt offerings, which was profane, they thought it best to pull it down lest it should be a reproach to them, because the heathen had defiled it. Wherefore, they had pulled it down. So they say, you know what, we're going to pull down the altar, but we're not going to destroy it. They said, we'll pull it down, we'll move it, and put it away until a prophet comes. Did I say that yet? Mm -hmm. Next verse. I'll read it. And laid up the stones in the mountain of the temple in a convenient place, until there should come a prophet to show what should be done with them. Right, so they took down the altar because the heathen profaned it. They, cooked, they, they sacrificed swine's flesh. They had sex on it. So they took it down, but they didn't destroy it. They waited till a prophet come to tell them what to do with it. Why did they not destroy it? Anybody? Why would they not destroy the, the altar? Was okay. Because of the anointed stones. Very good. Very good. Because it was anointed by remember back in Exodus 35. Very good. It was anointed. So they didn't want to destroy it. Anything that it dripped on it, the touched it, was anointed. So they put it away in a convenient place until a prophet would come and tell them what to do. Verse 47. Then they took whole stones according to the law. And built a new altar according to the form. And that's Deuteronomy 27, the whole stone. You know. And made up the sanctuary and the things that were within the temple and hollowed the courts. Read. They made also new holy vessels and into the temple they brought the candlestick and the altar of burnt offerings and of incense and the table. And upon the altar they burned incense and the lamps that they were upon the candlestick they lighted, that they might give light in the temple. Furthermore, they set the loaves upon the table and spread out the veils and finished all the works which they had begun to make. Now on the fifth and twentieth day of the ninth month, which is called the month Kaslu, in the hundred forty and eighth year, they rose up betimes in the morning. So how many years was it from the time that they... They defiled the temple until the time we got it back. How many years? Anybody remember? Say again? Three years. Three years. Today. Three years we were without the temple. And on the same day on the third year, from the I think it was uh I don't know that one forty five to one to let me go back. Am I right? Uh, 148th year, 145th year. That's great. Let's go back. Where is it at? First Maccabees. Give me a second. I'll find it. First Maccabees 140, 54. First Maccabees chapter 1, verse 54. Now the 15th day of the month Caslu, in the 145th year, they set up the abomination of desolation upon the altar. So it was three years, correct. Three years from the time they destroyed it until we rededicated it. Back in uh, 1 Maccabees 4. 
First Maccabees chapter 4, verse 53. Verse 53. And offered sacrifice according to the law upon the new altar of burnt offerings, which they had made. Look at what time and what day the heathen had profaned it. Even in that was it dedicated with songs and cisterns and harps and cymbals. Then all the people fell upon their faces, worshiping and praising the God of heaven, who had given them good success. And so they kept the dedication of the altar eight days and offered burnt offerings with gladness and sacrificed the sacrifice of deliverance and praise. They decked also the forefront of the temple with crowns of gold and with shields, and with the gates and the chambers they renewed and hanged doors upon them. Thus was there very great gladness among the people, for that the reproach of the heathen was put away. Moreover, Judas and his brethren with the whole congregation of Israel ordained that the days of the dedication of the altar should be kept in their season from year to year by the space of eight days, from the fifth and twentieth day of the month Caslu, with mirth and gladness. And that's why we keep it. We keep it because Judas and the brethren and the whole congregation of Israel ordained that the days of dedication of the altar should be kept in their seasons. So from then, when Judas ordained it, now I've heard people say, well, that wasn't found in in Leviticus the twenty third chapter, that's where the days, most high holy days, are found. So why do we have to keep it? Because Judas and his brethren ordained, and the people ordained that we kept it. Now watch this. Hold this. Go to John in the New Testament. Saint John's ten. Saint John's ten, verse twenty two. This is the book of John, chapter 10, and verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. So, in the New Testament, it mentioned the Feast of Dedication, it was winter. Read on. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. And where was Christ at? Keeping the Feast of Dedication. So, if it's good enough for the Messiah, <laughs> then it's good enough for everybody else to keep it. Right. He himself, or he himself, Remembered and commemorated the day. That's why it says Judges 5 and 11 that we have to rehearse the righteous acts. He remembered those days. They remembered the, the great deliverance God has given his children. Back. I'm about to finish it off in a second. Verse 59. First Maccabees chapter 4, verse 59. Moreover, Judas and his brethren with the whole congregation of Israel ordained that the days of the dedication of the altar should be kept in the season from year to year by the space of eight days, from the five and twentieth day of the month of Caslu with mirth and gladness. Sweet. At that time also they builded up the Mount Zion with high walls and strong towers round about, lest the Gentiles should come and tread it down as they had done before. Sweet. And they set there a garrison to keep it and fortified Bethsura to preserve it. Now, we read about we read about the great deliverance God gave us, the great victory he gave us. We read about Christ also keeping it. Now, what about we keeping it outside of Jerusalem? Because Christ was in Jerusalem keeping it. Can we keep it outside of Jerusalem? What scripture? Nope. Second Maccabees chapter 1 I want you to read verse 1 there's the book the second book of the Maccabees the first chapter the brethren the Jews that be at Jerusalem and in the land of Judea wish unto the brethren the Jews that are throughout Egypt health and peace so the Jews that were Jerusalem were writing their brethren that was Jews that was in Egypt. That's why it says in um, Isaiah 11, 11, that we would come out of Egypt. Um, Acts 2, there were Jews that came out of Egypt because we were scattered there according to the curse in Deuteronomy 28, 64. 
we're going to be carried to all nations. Now watch this. Jump on down to verse 18. Verse 18. Therefore, whereas we are now purposed to keep the purification of the temple upon the five and twentieth day of the month, Caslu, we thought it necessary to certify you thereof, that ye also might keep it, as the Feast of Tabernacles. So they wrote their brethren that were in Egypt, they weren't in Jerusalem, and certified that you keep this feast day just like we're keeping in Egypt. So today we told brothers, certify them that you here in America or Jamaica or England, wherever you at, you keep the feast day to remember the deliverance God gave his children, gave us. And he said you keep it as a feast of what? Meaning what? Right. And the first day and the last days we honor as Sabbaths. So tonight, from tonight to tomorrow night, we will not shop, buy, in some cases work if we're able to, if God permits us. And the last day, we'll keep it like the Feast of Tabernacles as found in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. So read that verse again. Therefore, whereas we are now purposed to keep the purification of the temple upon the 5 and 20th day of the month, Caslu, we thought it necessary to certify you thereof that ye might also keep it as the Feast of Tabernacles and of the fire which was given us when Nehemiah offered sacrifice after that he built the temple and the altar. So it's going back to Nehemiah when Nehemiah made it back into the land. Remember, after he came out from under the Persian rule, Nehemiah, well, we weren't, under, we, weren't, we weren't from under them, but we were able to go back to the land. Nehemiah built back up the walls, they rededicated to the temple back at that time also. So it wasn't, that's why scripture sometimes is two, three, four. We redid it. Uh, Nehemiah rededicated the temple back to the Most High at that time. Now I want to say something real quick. Before we finish, there's something I want to read real quick on it. Okay, I want to go to 2 Maccabees 9. And we're going to wrap it up here. 2 Maccabees 9 and 1. 2 Maccabees chapter 9 verse 1. About that time came Antiochus with dishonor out of the country of Persia. So now, while all this was happening, we was rededicating all to his get it. Antiochus was losing a war out of Persia. Read on. For he had entered the city called Persepolis and went about to rob the temple and to hold the city, whereupon the multitude running to defend themselves with their weapons put them to fight. And it so happened that Antiochus, being put to flight of the inhabitants, returned with shame. Now when he came back to... Let me stop. So I'm going to explain this a little bit right here. So when it says, uh, about the time Antiochus was in Desana out of the country of Persia, he entered the city of Peronopolis and went about to rob the temple and hold the, and, uh, says, rob the temple and to hold the city, whereupon the multitude running to defend themselves with their weapons put them to flight. Hold this, go back to 1 Maccabees 1. One verse 16. Uh, one verse 15. 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verse 15. And made themselves uncircumcised. And no, no, I'm, I'm sorry, 2 Maccabees 1, 15. 2 Maccabees chapter 1, verse 15. Which when the priest of Nadia had set forth, and he was entered with a small company into the compass of the temple, they shut the temple as soon as Antiochus was come in. And opening a privy door of the roof, they threw stones like thunderbolts and struck down the captain, hewed them in pieces, smote off their head, and cast them to those that were without. So as we was rededicating the temple, uh, Antiochus was losing the fight that he had in there. He almost lost his life right then and there. They smoked down rocks from the temple and killed his captain of his host. So we get to chapter 9. Read 9 and 1 now. 2 Maccabees chapter 9, verse 1. About that time came Antiochus with dishonor out of the country of Persia. For he had entered the city called Persopolis and went about to rob the temple and to hold the city, 
Whereupon the multitude running to defend themselves with their weapons put them to flight. And it so happened that Antiochus, being put to flight of the inhabitants, returned with shame. Now when he came to Ecbatan, news was brought him what had happened unto Nicanor and Timotheus. So when you read on the history, Nicanor and Timotheus, they fought against Judas Maccabees too. So word came to him that they would lose. Read on. Verse 4. Then swelling with anger, he thought to avenge upon the Jews the disgrace done unto him by those that made him flee. Therefore commanded he his chariot men to dry without seizing and to dispatch the journey, the judgment of God now following him. For he had spoken proudly in this sort, that he would come to Jerusalem and make it a common burying place of the Jews. So he heard what the word came to him that Jerusalem was winning these, these battles over and over again. It took back the temple, rededicated you see, you know what? He just lost in Persia. He said, I'm going to go kill these Jews. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you get home, read the rest of the history and see what happens. <laughs> I can't help it. I'm going to read it now. <laughs> it's too good to let it pass. All right, read on. But the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, smote him with an incurable and invisible plague. For as soon as he had spoken these words, a pain of the bowels that was remediless came upon him and sore torments of the inner parts. So he, he got sick, and there was no remedy for it. Read on. And that most justly, for he had tormented other men's bowels with many and strange torments. Now it says he tormented other men's bowels with strange torments. Read Second Maccabees, the seventh chapter, when you get a chance. Read on. Howbeit he nothing at all ceased from his bragging, but still was filled with pride, breathing out fire in his rage against the Jews. So even while all this judgment is passing on him, he still would not humble down. Keep reading. Howbeit he nothing at all ceased from his bragging, but still was filled with pride, breathing out fire in his rage against the Jews, and commanding to haste the journey. But it came to pass that he fell down from his chariot, carried violently, so that having a sore fall, all the members of his body were much pain. So with all his pain, he fell off his chariot, got dragged. <laughs> uh, read on. And thus, he that a little afore thought he might command the waves of the sea. So proud was he beyond the condition of man. And weigh the high mountains in a balance, was now cast on the ground, and carried in a horse litter, showing forth unto all the manifest power of God. I thought he was a pith. I thought he was God manifested on earth. Read on. So that the worms rose up out of the body of this wicked man. And while he lived, sorrow and pain, his flesh fell away. When you all get a chance, you all stop up here. You can, you can watch it for yourself. Mm. People understand when you read the words of the Bible, I like video. I like, I like visual. Shalom, Israel. I'm Elder Nathaniel, Israel United in Christ. YouTube likes to shut our channels down, as some of you have noticed, <laughs> ever so often. Subscribing to join IUIC will assure you will always stay connected to our YouTube accounts. We want to do our best to make sure this truth gets out. Please click and join our subscriber YouTube channel called Join IUIC to stay linked to all of our videos. So again, Please make sure you subscribe to this Join IUIC channel to get your latest updates on all our YouTube channels. Shalom.